In 2020, we brought you the story of Fred Hayes, a Biloxian whose journey was to land a spacecraft on the moon, explore it, and return safely back to Earth. We've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like you to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. In addition, uh, I have a shaft and trunnion okay. for a look at the Comet Bennett if you need it. Okay. Stand by. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, we've had a problem here. This is Houston. Say again, please. Houston, uh, we've had a problem. problem. With those words, everything changed. No landing, no exploration, just survival. In the end, it all worked out. The three astronauts returned safely back to Earth. And although Fred Hayes never made it back to the moon, here on Earth, his journey continues. Our journey to celebrate Fred Hayes and the Apollo 13 50th anniversary also had a problem. COVID, cancer, and Zeta. COVID, well, you know the story. Our artist, Mary Davison, was treated for breast cancer and survived and is back to work. Hurricane Zeta damaged the pedestal on which Fred Hayes' sculpture will be erected. It, too, will be repaired, and we will go on. Let's take a look back at our journey to bring you the story of this history-making voyage and to update you on the sculpture being created by Mary Davison. We begin at the Infinity Science Center, located in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, on the day before its closure due to COVID-19. And uh, as we first uh, home we lived in was actually a duplex on Lemieux Street, uh, just over the railroad tracks, about four houses uh, up from the Barks uh, root beer factory. And I spent a lot, I was very interested. I spent a lot of time, I walked down the street and looking, they had a side window. You could look in at all the mechanical uh, aspects of bo box bottles, all glass in those days. Coming down the assembly line, uh, getting filled and what caps put on them. I was amazed at uh, the machinery that was uh, doing that. Uh, we later moved and the only house uh, uh, mom and dad owned was on Church Street. Uh, out uh, just off uh, Single Block Street, off Division Street, where the uh, north end of that street ran right into the Garnfo Elementary Schoolyard. And uh, of course, that street has since, since been named after Powell 13 Flight, uh, Hay Street, at Single Block Street. Uh, I have two sisters, uh, Brenda, now Brenda Johnston, who uh, was seven years and five months uh, younger than I. And even a younger daughter, as actually I was starting to head off to college, uh, was my sister Edie, who was 17 years uh, uh, younger than me. And so that, that, that was the family. I had no brothers. I was the oldest. My mom was just a, a homemaker uh, during most of that period. Uh, my dad uh, worked for the VA center, initially at the Biloxi facility, and I forget which shop. Well, initially he was in the boiler room. And I remember sometimes as a little kid, I'd go with him to work and spend a few hours in this boiler room that was furnishing the steam for the heating and heating water. And uh, again, all that, all that machinery down in that sort of basement area, uh, the, one of the main, near the, one of the main hospitals. Uh, he then took over one of the uh, shops. I'm not sure it was a carpenter or machine shop and eventually uh, ran all the shops both at the uh, Biloxi facility and later also the Gulfport facility. Uh, my dad was a good handy person, could do almost anything, uh, any type of task that way. Well, that, that was the reason I, I transferred. It was funny, at one point, uh, Neil, who had uh, was ahead of me about three years, Neil started with NASA at Lewis and went to Edwards. And then Neil uh, applied and uh, went into the astronaut program he visited back at the uh, Flight Research Center and 
Don Malik and I, another pilot, talked to him and asked him what it's like to be an astronaut. Neil's uh, uh, summary for us was, well, you attend a lot of meetings, you sit in a simulator a lot, and you don't do much good flying. So that was Neil's summary of being an astronaut. Because, you know, you don't fly to space that often, whereas at Edwards, we were flying every day something. I was normally involved in three different test programs at the same time. So I had to think real hard about whether I should even apply. But then I said, well, there's a chance to go to the moon, and that'd be a great adventure. And if I stay here at Edwards, I'm not going to have that chance. So that's really what convinced me I should apply and uh, sign up for the astronaut program. You go through a rookie, uh, at that time, a year of training. I think today they just put the latest group through two years. Uh, we, we were supposed to have a year of, I call it rookie training. And it turned out uh, things got so busy in the early development of, uh, of uh, this Apollo vehicles, uh, the command module, uh, lunar module, the spacesuits, that they needed us to do uh, support roles uh, following the development of various uh, parts. And so I really only got about uh, probably nine to 10 months of that rookie training before I got a first assignment uh, to, to uh, w under Jim McDivitt and that crew who were slated to fly the first lunar module in Earth orbit on a mission. And uh, Jim McDivitt, uh, Ed Mitchell and I, who later walked on the moon, reported to uh, Jim and he gave us simple instructions. He said, I want you to go to Grumman the company that was building the lunar module. And I want you to make sure I got a good limb to fly. That was it. So Ed and I, between us, we spent the next uh, almost a year at Grumman in the, involved in the uh, testing, early testing of all the uh, lunar modules up to uh, limb five, the first uh, vehicle that ended up landing on the moon. Uh, assuring they made it through factory tests and were ready to ship to Kennedy Space Center to get ready for launch. How you got your crew assignments was kind of a mystery. Uh, it, was, I, it was mostly done uh, between uh, Deke Slayton, who was head of uh, flight operations at the time, and Al Shepard, who was head of the astronaut office. And I think they uh, sort of lined up the crews. Generally speaking, uh, uh, as I found out later when I was named backup commander of 16, they would, one of them would call you in the office and tell you your position and suggest who might be with you on the crew and give you an opportunity to say if that was acceptable or not. So at any rate, my first assignment was really because of uh, Mike Collins having a medical problem. He was on the prime crew of Apollo 8 and uh, could not fly the mission because of that. So Jim Lovell, who was on the backup crew, moved up to that prime crew assignment and that opened a position. So my first real crew assignment was as the backup lunar module pilot on Apollo 8 with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. We were the backup crew. What happened uh, on our mission was uh, a week before launch, uh, inadvertently, Charlie Duke uh, had taken a son to a birthday party and had been exposed to measles. Uh, he told the medics about that, and of course, they did then a bunch of testing, taking blood almost every morning and sending it somewhere for analysis, somewhere for analysis. And uh, three days before launch uh, was determined and a decision made that Ken Manningly, being a bachelor, had never been married, had never had measles as a child, was very likely to come down with measles during the flight. So he was uh, removed and Jack Schweigert, the backup command module pilot, replaced him two and a half days before launch. Well, at the, at the time uh, that happened, Jim Lovell and I were down in the landing craft, the lunar module. We had, we had looked at uh, TV shows that had been shown on previous missions and Jim and I decided to use the lunar module as our stage for a planned TV show using equipment that we knew had not been talked about before. So it's kind of a show and tell uh, setting. And Jack Schweigert was all alone left in the command module to watch over things at the time. 
uh, the, just after, it wasn't very long after we finished and closed off the TV show, this uh, big bang happened. Uh, kind of rattled through the, the vehicles are metal, so it's kind of like if you're inside of a, a big uh, barrel, metal barrel, and somebody hits on it with a sledgehammer. Uh, rocket, little small rocket engines that normally hold attitude were firing. We could feel some motion, not very, not very uh, much motion, but some motion of the vehicles. And uh, so instantly we knew this is not normal. This is something wrong. Uh, Jim Lovell had, had drifted up into the command module by that time. Jack uh, Swigert had made the call, Houston, we've had a problem here. And Jim repeated it because Houston did not reply to Jack. And I shortly also floated up in zero G back to my position in the right couch. A uh, quick scan of the instrument panel told me from two different readings on meters that we had lost oxygen tank two, number two. We had two tanks. Number one looked still fine, still intact. So I didn't think it was life threatening instantly at that point. But I was sick to my stomach with disappointment because I knew losing even one of the two tanks meant we weren't going to get to land on the moon. It took some time of troubleshooting. Uh, in fact, uh, mission control thought for 18 minutes because of the uh, different array of caution and warning lights on in different systems that were not related in any way that it was false, they were false signals. That's something that happened in the caution and warning uh, electronics. Uh, after 18 minutes, they got busy because it was now for sure real and Jim had reported seeing a gas or something fluid flowing away from the spacecraft, seen it out the window. And uh, we went into troubleshooting mode, mainly now because we'd also detected there was a leak in the second remaining oxygen tank. Uh, slow leak, but it, it was clear the pressure uh, quantity was going down. When I looked up and saw both uh, oxygen pressures, one absolutely zero and the other one going down. Uh, it, it dawned on me, and I'm sure Jack and Fred about the same time, that we were indeed in serious trouble. And so we were put through a number of steps to try to isolate that leak, to save the second tank. And it really was about an hour into this that they had run out of ideas. We tried almost anything they could think of to try to try to stop that leak unsuccessfully. So it's clear we're gonna have to shut down the mothership. Pressure in O2 tank one is all the way down to 297. You better think about getting in the LEM or using the LEM systems. I'd say this is a serious uh, situation that we have ever had in manned space flight. We've always called the LEM a good lifeboat under those circumstances. So at that time, we were asked, Jim Lovell and I, to go to the lunar module and power it up. The thing we're gonna land on the moon with. It was a second spacecraft and could serve as a home, a lifeboat, they called it, that would give us an environmental system, uh, give us communication, it could give us thrusters to control, uh, all the things we would need uh, in the interim period to work our way back home. So that's what we did. We, Jim and I left and got very busy powering up the lunar module. And the critical step was transferring the inertial measuring unit angles which is the device that tells you how to point very accurately. Because you need it very accurate to do any engine maneuvers uh, to change the path, the trajectory. So we could manually do that, but Jack given us the readings out of a <clears throat> three registers called Noun 20s that Jim could manually, he did manually crank them into the limb computer that would torque that platform when we powered it up to those angles. So we had a good platform, it was very critical. Uh, at the time, we were not going around the moon in, the, in a way that would have got us home. Uh, if we'd done nothing from that point, we would have missed the Earth. But I think about later, they did a simulation years later, figured out we'd have missed the Earth by about 3,000 miles. And probably looped around the moon twice more before eventually entering in the Earth. But at any rate, so the first critical thing was to get on a path get us back with the moon's gravity turn to get roughly back to home. Uh, it was interesting, uh, later, I, uh, the, first, the first maneuver done, uh, Glenn Lunny had taken over from Gene Krantz as the flight director, and they, the guys were 
the FIDOs, flight dynamics officers, were arguing about, well, where do you want us to, to get, get us back to? And Glenn's instruction was, just get us back to any place on Earth. So that was the first maneuver they did, and it would have landed us in the Indian Ocean by Madagascar. Uh, no, I never, never had high confidence uh, at any point that we had all everything figured out and needed to the ground. This was kind of an incremental thing of trying to stay one step ahead as things came up, like mentioned the lithium hydroxide. That took some time over a day to realize that lithium, that li uh, carbon dioxide was building up and we needed a way to get rid of it. And the lunar module, which had a different shaped cartridge of this lithium material, which could scrub the air of carbon dioxide, did not have enough because we're going to have to make this vehicle last four days versus two days. So they had the jury rig a way to use the abundant cartridges we had from the mothership, which was a square shape. And they figured that out and actually tested it in a chamber in building a seven at Houston. Uh, in a, they had a limb environmental system set up in the chamber and tested that it worked before they sent the instructions up to us. So they did some creative engineering to put a round peg in a square hole or vice versa. Vice versa. Had that not been able to be done, if they couldn't have found any way to do that, would the carbon dioxide have eventually taken over? It was, yeah, it was, approach, it was at the red line when, they, when we finally got that rigged. So that was another close call. That was another close call, right. Uh, the, the first two maneuvers we did, the first one to get us around the moon, the second one, two hours after we passed the low point behind the moon, was also using the computer, fully automated. Uh, that was great because that shortened our time on the return by 10 hours and also put us back where the recovery force was with the Iwo Jima aircraft carrier by the Samoan Islands, so it had benefit of that as well. The next two corrections uh, mid-course, which are very small maneuvers, not very long used. First one using a decent engine for 14 seconds. Uh, second one about 22 seconds using the 400 pound attitude thrusters, all four of them firing in one direction, uh, were done uh, to correct, tweak the trajectory on the, on the way home. Those were all done manually. Uh, make an alignment uh, first out the window using uh, a coas, which is like a gun sight. Jim Lovell would line on the earth cusp. It was a half earth, so he'd line on the edges of that half earth and then pitch up to where I could see in a periscope, an AOT, which is normally used to shoot stars. When I saw the sun come into view, we froze the attitude, and that's how we fixed the attitude to do those maneuvers. But controlling it manually for those very short periods. After we got back, I talked to people and some had expressed a concern uh, about the heat shield. It never occurred, to, at least to me. Uh, the heat shield uh, is a pretty tough material. It's a very tough material that normally is used to dissipate the heat by somewhat burning away as you come through entry. I never suspected, because uh, when we saw the damaged area, when we separated the service module, it looked like the quarter of the spacecraft panel had blown straight out in a way not downward toward where the heat shield was. So and it didn't look like there was that much shrapnel or anything that would, it could have damaged it. So after you cut that module away, you got to get a pretty good look at what had happened. Well, service module, yes. When we separated it, we shot a lot of pictures, in fact, of the damaged area for the accident investigation. What was y'all's reaction to that? Well, we, we were somewhat shocked by the amount of damage we saw, because like I said, a quarter of the spacecraft had blown off. And there was uh, broken wires hanging out, torn thermal blankets, you know, quite a bit of disarray in that area. And thinking back, the, the uh, intent of the explosion we felt uh, did not seem that severe, frankly, for what we, the damage we saw.
yes, follow, following that mission, uh, we did some public affairs, obviously, uh, which is pretty traditional after a mission. Whoever had just flown was put on a circuit. Uh, we had a uh, parade in Chicago, ticker tape parade, which I missed. I, I had gotten ill with a urinary tract infection, and so I did not make that trip. We went to testify to a Congress committee, uh, a lot of other public affairs events, both uh, in the States as well as overseas. But within a month, uh, Deke uh, Slayton called me in and told me I had an, another new job as the backup commander to Apollo 16. So I was ha very happy with that. I thought, well, here I maybe have a second chance uh, to get back because at that time, the last mission to the moon was Apollo 19 which flying 16 would have had me fly 19. So uh, I, I was happy I had built uh, Jerry Carr and Bill Pogue assigned with me as the crew. And uh, so, I, like I said, we were training for about four or five months uh, before 18 and 19 got canceled. So I had a second point of disappointment. I was, uh, I went off briefly to Harvard Business School. I, long range, I was interested and getting into program management. And I got back, uh, for, it was a pressure cooker course, program for management development, four months uh, course. And I went into the Arbiter Project Office. So I really went into program management on early shuttle uh, for four years. Uh, so I was there from day one when we were evaluating the proposals on who should build it, all the way through uh, getting it uh, through the design phase, into the uh, early testing phase, and then, of course, uh, getting ready to fly the first vehicle, Enterprise. And at that time, I was really surprised and happy. I was named as one of four people that were going to get to fly Enterprise, the very first orbiter we built at a program out at Edwards Air Force Base in 1977, where we're going to air launch it off the top of a 747. So we had an eight test flight program and I got to command five of the uh, eight flights in that program. But you never flew the shuttle into space? I never flew into space. I was designated to fly the third orbital mission. Uh, at the time, I would have stayed had we kept the mission. Uh, Jack Lausma was gonna fly it with me, and we were gonna go up and rescue Skylab. Skylab was uh, fixing the, worried about falling in and our, we, we were training, including building a little kick stage following the development of a little booster that we're going to fly in the payload bay that Jack actually was training to fly it. After we got close on the rendezvous, he was going to, we we're going to release it and he would fly it over and dock it with Skylab. And then the mission control would worry about which way Skylab's pointing and fire the booster after we got clear. Uh, but the, unfortunately, uh, the shuttle launch schedule slipped, went further out, and Skylab fell in earlier than even they thought with uh, sunspot activity activity that uh, ballooned our atmosphere a bit and caused more drag, and Skylab fell in more quickly. So I, when that mission went away, uh, the mission that then was going to be flown, uh, I, I wasn't interested in. So I had the opportunity to uh, become an aerospace executive at Grumman Corporation in New York. So I left NASA at that point in 1979. That was while I was in the program office, actually. I'd been in the shuttle program office, and I was doing sport flying with uh, a group that was putting on air shows, <clears throat> at, uh, mainly at Galveston or Dallas-Fort Worth, mostly in the Texas area, using World War II aircraft, some real ones, B-17, P-40. Uh, I was involved in the opening act of the show, which was using a number of aircraft that had been modified to look like Japanese aircraft. And we, uh, we staged the attack on Pearl Harbor, where they had some pyrotechnics set up in the field. And we actually didn't start at that field. We started at another field and came roaring in like the attack on Pearl Harbor. And uh, I was flying what was a converted Volte vibrator, a BT-13, pre-World War II trainer that had been converted to look like the Japanese Val dive bomber. And one day I was just bearing it from a short distance from Angleton, Texas, where it had been kept at a crop duster seal to Galveston Shoals Field to get washed up 
on a rack we had there to get ready for the next air show at Dallas. And I got too close on an airplane ahead of me. We flew in formation. And I was afraid I was going to run over over on, on the runway and did a go around putting the power on. And at about 300 foot altitude, the engine quit. So I switched uh, quickly fuel tanks to the other wing tank, pumped the wobble pump, which is a little hand pump to get fuel pressure and it could get the engine to sputter, run for a little bit and then quit. So I milked it around anyway. I was headed right into the Gulf of Mexico, southbound. And I did not want to go in the Gulf because it had a fixed gear. I couldn't raise the landing gear, fixed gear airplane. And I knew if I went in the Gulf, it'd probably flip over upside down. And it was shallow water. I'd be trapped in it. You want to be in deep water if you're going in the water and you're going to flip over. So anyway, I made, made it around 180 degrees and landed on the far west side of Shoals Field. And when I hit in some uh, not necessarily smooth terrain, eventually ended up being part of a housing project. I, uh, one gear broke off, wing dug in, it flipped, and I ended up upside down backwards, and it caught on fire. Before I could uh, get out, because the canopy was jammed shut, and I had to kick a hole to get out, I received burns over 65%. And the uh, ambulance was already on the way. The person about a block over saw this happen. And they called the ambulance to pick me up, take me to the uh, University of Texas Hospital at Galveston, to the burn ward there where I spent the next three months uh, going through uh, the, the taking care of the, the burns, including debris in, and eventually grafting before I could get released. Well, as you said, I've received a lot of awards. Uh, some uh, I, I feel uh, uh, are more precious. Uh, I've enjoyed more and appreciated more because they were from peers, like from the Society of Experimental Test Pilots. I was test pilot of the year uh, one year after the, the shuttle test. And because uh, that's uh, made by voting of your peers. Uh, this one is also exceptional in that way. This is by my hometown, uh, who I spent a lot of years here. And I'll have to say I was chasing those uh, rainbows I chased uh, in, new, in dreams of more adventures to do. It took me away for about 45 years, although I came back often to visit my mother and uh, sister's family uh, over those years, whenever I could get an airplane and fly in the Keesler Air Force Base. Uh, so this is a particular honor to be so honored. I hope the statue uh, serves more as uh, not as a Fred Hayes thing over time, but as a representation if you grow up even in a small town like Bluxy, with the right upbringing and uh, the right training and education along the way, uh, what you can achieve. Well, what, what's the, the honor you're talking about there, which is also great, is the uh, A1 test stand. Uh, there's an A1, there's an A2, and the, the B stand is where the uh, current SLS uh, big rocket is sitting and that they're going to test shortly. Uh, the A1 stand uh, was used to test uh, J2 engines, which were uh, the engines on the second and the third stage of the Saturn. So I, the Saturn I flew had six of those engines, J2 engines. So there's obviously a direct affinity that uh, engines I, that uh, I depended on that got me on my way to the moon uh, came out of a stennis that got me on my way. Uh, so I, I, it's a great honor. Later it did a lot, a lot of testing on the shuttle engines, the liquid SSMEs they're called. Uh, so all through the shuttle program it, that the stand was used for that. I guess the creation uh, came through uh, uh, Roy Estes, uh, Leo Seal, and Myron Webb, who was that time uh, public affairs, uh, they decided with 9-11 and the security requirements that were imposed on all NASA facilities, but at Stennis, it pretty much uh, dampened any of uh, the tenants they had at the Stenosphere, which is a small museum out at Stennis. So between the three of them, they wanted to create something off-site. And uh, so the way that it was set up, it was with a not-for-profit that Mr. Leo Seal was the initial chairman, and he asked me to join the board. That was like 14 years ago. And uh, I, was, I was interested primarily uh, for what I would 
to see it would do with children's education. And what, what at least at that time we were surmising would be the content in this uh, museum. So that's why I uh, joined the board. I'd been retired at that point from Northrop Grumman. And so that's what got me out of my rocking chair uh, to join the board here. And I've been involved uh, ever since. With, well, they have, a, they have a plan and a program, and they're developing uh, the hardware at this point. Whether it meets, number one, the schedule they've got laid out, <clears throat> and whether ultimately they achieve the goal, it depends on the uh, annual funding levels. <clears throat> Their plan requires a certain funding level <clears throat> that would have to be approved through administration and Congress. And it's, the, the, old, the old question mark is always, Will Congress support it in uh, that way? Do you think we should be going back? I think we should be going back to then, there, and also Mars. We ought to continue exploration, not just uh, with people, but the un unmanned uh, work that's been done by JPL to look at uh, all, all parts of our solar system. And hopefully, if we find the right exoplanet, they call it, that's out there around another star system, way, way far out there, maybe even have a uh, capability to send a probe uh, to look at things there. Since Adam and Eve, Fred is one of only 24 people to have flown to the moon and back. He has been a tremendous asset to Biloxi and the coast, inspiring students in Biloxi Public Schools and being the driving force in creating the Infinity Space Center near the Stennis Space Center. We have a statue dedicated to the old world explorer, Pierre Lemoyne d'Iberville down at the Biloxi Visitor Center. And I wanna see a statue, a new community landmark that pays homage to our new world explorer, Fred Hayes. The city of Biloxi commissioned Marriott Davidson to create a full size sculpture of Fred Hayes to be erected on the beach in front of the Biloxi Lighthouse overlooking the Gulf of Mexico. We take you to Mary's studio where her work begins. Mary Ott Tremel Davidson, and I have the privilege of doing an image of astronaut Fred Hayes. This is a fantastic project that I'm really enjoying. He had has such a wonderful smile that that's what I'm really working on right now to to put together to to put together. Now, what are people looking at right here? They're looking at his bust, which um, I hope to have ready by April for the event. How would you describe this? <laughs> what what was this? Is a clay image. Um, that I'm trying to achieve and, and gather the likeness of Fred. His youthfulness, his enthusiasm, his, his wonderful smile. And you, uh, you of course know Fred. I have met him, yes. Uh, I know his sister Brenda, of course she was. Does it make it easier that the person is alive? Yes, but I would love to have him sitting here. That's the tr that's the tough part. Trying to get photos and, and gathering the side view, the front view, um, at that age in his outfit is, is the big difficulty, really. Because most, even when I did Bishop Howes, I, I, he sat for me. Mm -hmm. So it's great to have a, our live model, but it's... A lot more difficult to do it from pictures, obviously. It, it, it would be really great to have a live cooperative model. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, and he's a busy man. He, he really, I know he does a lot of philanthropic work. I know that he's very close to infinity. But how long have you been doing this? And why do you do it? Well, the first commission was with the uh, Alexi Chamber of Commerce for the Opperville. Mm -hmm. Back in 1997, my husband worked very closely with me on that project. We finished it in 1998 in time for the 1699 uh, anniversary of the and, founding of Biloxi. And now you're doing another explorer. Yes. 
for outer space, yes. In early 2020, Mary Davidson was diagnosed with breast cancer. Faced with the thought of not being able to complete the sculpture, not only on time, but maybe not at all. In December of 2020, I visited Mary at her studio to find out how she and the project are doing. So, well, Mary, um, it's been a while since we've been here in the studio. What's been going on over these months? Well, quite a few things. I did manage to finish the bust of Fred back, uh, actually, March. But in the meantime, they discovered I had breast cancer. So then I had all those lovely treatments of chemo and radiation physical therapy to give movement, more better movement to my arms. And it took a few few months away from this project, I have to admit, much to my chagrin. So now I'm back at it, feeling much better. Then along came, of course, our good old COVID-19 virus. But in a way, it's an asset for me because I, I shouldn't be out roaming the streets for any good reason. I can be home here working on this statue. So that's what I'm up to. Well, it looks like you're hard at it. I see two good legs there. Uh, I presume that's Fred Hayes' legs. Yes, that's that's the beginning of him. I said they, they look really mammoth, but if you're going to have a figure which is larger than life, you need to upscale it everything. So his knees are 22 inches above the ground. So this, um, you've got a light set of legs, you've got a head, and I guess there's a torso that will eventually go on this as well. Huh? Right, right. Now that's, that's the real intriguing part of this, because it's like putting the cart before the horse, because normally you start with the bottom and you work your way up, but I already have that completed bust, which I have to make everything else in proportion. Proportions are everything. So that's the real challenging part. Well, that started first, uh, was it for the presentation that we made, uh, I guess right. about a year ago now. I mean, we've just been about a year since we started the project. Well, actually, I think the that big event was supposed to be April the 10th, but it never happened, of course, due to COVID. So uh, yeah, he's been he's been ready for quite a while. So uh, tell me what the process has been in getting this far. Okay, so the first thing what you want to do is to make a wooden armature. So there's wood going all down through this. And then I buy large, large, very large chunks of styrofoam. And I put it together so it's like an additive process, but then I have to go back with my little scraper and do what they call a subtractive process. So that's really like working with stone, except this is a lot softer. So you're sculpting in styrofoam. Exactly. I'll do the whole figure in styrofoam. The reason for that is that it reduces the weight. If I did it all in clay, he would be monstrously heavy. But this way, he still will be sizable and because of size, but uh, the clay won't be nearly as thick as it would have been otherwise. And that makes a big difference in transportation mainly. And my husband and I will take him up to the foundry for the first step in getting him cast into bronze. Now, will you do that before you do the other parts? Or will you go take everything together to the foundry? Uh, he will be completed in clay. Then we take him up and then a mold is made of him. Uh, the mold is like a plaster mold, really. And then uh, wax is poured into that. The first thing that's done is that a rubber uh, shell is put over the clay. And then the plaster mold is made of that. Then that rubber mold is taken out 
and wax is poured in. Now, then uh, I have to spend time going over everything because the wax isn't always perfect. And so I have to refine it. We spend time at the foundry doing that. Then after that, he is taken and another mold, which is called a ceramic shell mold, is put over the wax. And that takes quite a long period of time because it's a, it's a liquid mixture that uh, you have to add on layer by layer. Of course, each layer has to dry thoroughly and you can build up, you can have as many as 15 coats of it before the, you're finished. Then that ceramic shell mold is heated. So all the wax then melts out of it. So now you have a hollow mold. And then that is what you use to pour the bronze in. And that's a beautiful event. It's, it's still a thrill after over 40 years of working in bronze to see that gorgeous metal melting and poured into the mold. Then finally, the last stage is remove the mold. And then there are usually some extra pieces of bronze that you've used to help vent and to hold out arms, etc because you have to make sure that the metal gets all the way to the end of the hands. And sometimes you have to add pieces of wax in, which later become bronze, and then that has to be removed. So it's a big cleanup process at that point. Well, how far away are we from uh, seeing the foundry part of this, the completion of the sculpture and then the pouring? How far from this day? From now? Yeah, from now. When do you when do you expect it? I I think it might take me another year to do this. Okay. So we'll be back for more stories. I hope so. so. Good news. Mary is ahead of schedule. I visited with her recently to get the latest update. See, uh, Fred's growing. Yes, he is by leaps and bounds. <laughs> uh, he's going to soon be, uh, I'll definitely be on a ladder <laughs> the next stage. So where are we at now? Okay, what I've done is created a, a platform up here that the finished bust that I have will rest on that. And of course, here's, I have to do the arms first. So I do the wooden armature, then I put blocks of styrofoam on it, and then I have to carve it. It's just like carving stone, except styrofoam is, is easier in many respects. Then after that, then I will be able to, to do the clay over all of this and put in all the details that go in to the outfit. Now he is already at his waist taller than you. How much taller can we expect him to be? Well, he'll just be just under the ceiling here. He's going to be seven foot six. All right, a little over than what he is. <laughs> slightly, slightly. <laughs> and of course, we've been waiting now for months. Uh, we've had uh, a number of, uh, say, things to interfere with the project. Just a few. But, but um, so what's your expecting time now to get completed? Well, I'm hoping to get it to the foundry to be cast in bronze uh, at the beginning of, of the summer, if that all works oh, out with the city. Soon. All right. Well, that's sooner than I expected to hear from you. Well, uh, that's, what, that's my goal right now, and that's what I keep informing the foundry that they can expect to see us, but oh, we'll see how it goes. All right. Well, good. I think uh, 2021 is starting to shape up to be a little better. So in every I way. Think, all right, I think we'll get that. Now... Once that bust, this midsection, I should say, is completed, yep. you have a bust over here to my right that will be added to that. Yes, it will go on, it will rest on this platform that I've created, yes. All right. And um, 
you'll be diligently working now through, this is February, so you've got uh, several months to go before you really get ready for the casting part. Right, right. There's a lot of prep I have to do even for the clay before I can put it on. I have to uh, stretch it out and put it through rollers and get it thin enough. I use the hardest clay I can find so that it will, detail will be shown up. And where do you get this clay? I have to buy it out of Colorado. All right, so you don't go digging for it. No, no, pray not. <laughs> <laughs> and because we ha they have to send it across the Mississippi, my freight charges are twice well, what they should be. Say, you mean this Mississippi clay just don't cut it? No, pray not. Not this round, at least. <laughs> uh, have you ever used Mississippi clay? Oh, yet? yeah. yeah, Oh, yeah. In the beginning, we used yeah. to go to the Tudica Buff and, and get it just like George you, Orr. You went and dug it just like I Orr, did. Huh? I did. And uh, back in the day, what sort of things did you do? Well, that was back when we, I was making pots out of clay. I uh, have one of those pots. Maybe two. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so maybe that came from some of that Mississippi mud, huh? Absolutely. All right. Now, once uh, the bust is placed on top, you still have arms and other things to take yeah, care of. Yeah, you'll be holding a helmet, too. I noticed there's a what you call the armature. Yes. That, is that part of his arm that's sticking out there? That's right. That'll be the beginning. He's going to be coming back here, and he'll be holding the helmet to the side of him. And have you already completed the helmet? No, anyway? no, the helmet, uh, I, I plan to do that after I get the figure done. All right. When you go to the foundry, where was that located? It's just south of Atlanta. All right, so you've got to pack this thing up and cart it over 600 miles to Atlanta. And Yes, yes, we have two vehicles out there we're debating which one to use. I'd like to use the new one, uh, just relatively new, uh, as compared to the one that's 20 years old. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll be back as we progress through this because there's other steps and over the next few months, I'll probably be back to continually to progress on the development of this. Yeah, I'd like you to see the detail that I put yeah. into the clay, for yeah, sure. Just like the fisherman that we did, uh, there was a lot of detail in that, and I, I noticed that you'll probably have much of that to do here. Yes. Um, when the foundry pours, does that happen all in one day? The pouring is, but we have to build two sets of moles up there. So my husband and I will be making many trips up to the foundry, because we work with them. It's not a case of just dropping it off and they do the work. We go hand in hand. We do a first set of molds, it's a, which is a rubber mold with a plaster behind it to hold it in place. Then we pour wax into that. Then we take the wax and we build up another mold, much more complicated. It's called ceramic shell. That, and that's a very slow process. That will take them probably you know, well over six, eight weeks to do. Then after that dries, we melt out the wax and then we pour the bronze. But the pouring is, yes, in one day, it's bang. <laughs> and the metal is what? Bronze, silicon bronze, the best. All right, so maybe, would we say the end of the year for a completion? Oh, before that. Yeah. Before that. So we might finally get him on that pedestal that's sitting on the beach. Absolutely. All right. Well, I hope to see that. Mary, thank you again for this update. I appreciate it. My I'm gonna, pleasure. I'm going to let you get back to work. I know you got a lot of work to do. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Mary. This October, Fred Hayes could get his wish for America to return to the moon. In October 2021, NASA Artemis Project is planned for an unmanned flight to the moon to test the next generation of launch vehicles and crew capsules in preparation to land American astronauts on the moon in 2024. In future episodes of BTV, we'll have more updates on Fred Hayes, Mary Davidson, and another Biloxian whose work is preparing the U.S. for our next trip to the moon and beyond. Those stories in future episodes.